Welcome to Prophetic Bible Studies, our Apostolic Prophetic Empowerment midweek services held on Wednesday evenings. I am your teacher, Apostle Dr. Delisa, and we're going to continue this studies that we began in the month of June. Uh, for the month of June, we talked about engaging the authentic prophetic voice. And so for the month of July, we're going to cover uh, one of the books that I've written on prophetic. I've written several and I have many more to come. Uh, but this book is entitled The Six Obligations of the Prophet in Spiritual Warfare. If you don't already have the book, you can um, purchase it on Amazon and I've included the QR code there for you. Or you can um, place a comment in the links and we'll give you a uh, 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 means to go ahead and purchase the book. You can purchase it via hard copy or ebook, just whatever works for you. I've got maybe six copies on hand um, for those of you that are actually in house and don't have a copy, and we'll get that to you on Sunday. I also have a link here, tinyurl.com slash six obligations, and I'll take you directly to the Amazon link where you can order the book. I also want to just give a shout out to the ministries that have been ordering several books for your congregations. Thank you for encouraging the work that we do in um, bringing this teaching, bringing clarity to the art and the function and the execution of prophetic ministry. I take this work very seriously um, because it does involve representing or representing who God is to his people. So this is not something that we just attend a conference and pick up an impartation or an activation and we run. You need to take time to be discipled. You need to study to show yourself approved. And you need to mirror the heart of God when you are releasing what you say that he's saying to his people. That's a great responsibility. So we're going to get started. Um, I am, this message is pre-recorded. I am on location in the beautiful city of Las Vegas. I'm here for training. Um, so I am, uh, I'm, I've, I'll try to watch it live. We've got like a three hour time difference. So I'll try to watch it. Um, live, still a little jet lag, trying to keep up with what's going on at home and what's happening here. Um, it's a bit of a struggle, but nevertheless, we're going to do what God has required us to do. So the six obligations of the prophet in spiritual warfare, I'm first going to open up and share with you what our outline is going to look like. Um, I believe this book has like seven or eight chapters to it. For this particular week, I'm only going to cover chapter one and just give you a really good introductory um, background and foundation. And then for the following weeks, we'll cover about two to three chapters so that we can get done by July. Um, if we run out of time and we still have content to cover, I may come back on a Sunday or a Saturday. Anyway, we'll get it in, no worries. But um, we'll, we'll try to try our best to get it done. Uh, so I'm going to cover the outline. I'm only going to cover chapter one, may go a little bit into chapter two for, um, for today. And our theme scripture is coming out of Psalm 144, verse one. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. A very good friend of mine, a prophetess, pastor um, out of North Carolina has also written a book on this as well. She's a powerhouse. And, um, but this is gonna be our foundation scripture that God will teach you how to war. He will teach you and equip you how to fight. Okay, so we want you to keep in that, that in mind as we move forward. Now, I told you how we've um, got several topics that we need to cover from this book. And I've written this book, gosh, maybe eight years ago, maybe. Um, so some of the content that I share may be fresh revelation that's not necessarily written in the book. So you can marry those two together, together and come up with some tremendously good revelation that you can use in your own prophetic ministry and in your own prophetic walk. Um, so tonight, today we'll cover the prophet declares war, but in the following weeks to come, we'll talk about the prophet reminds the soldier of his assignment. The prophet instructs the soldier on who to take in the battle. That's so good. The prophet equips the soldier with tools to defeat the enemy. Um, the prophet pinpoints the enemy seat. You don't want to miss that one. And then the prophet guarantees victory when obedience is maintained. So you're going to find that these are going to be some strategic points that I'm going to share with you. I have found that they work. Okay, they have worked, they work, and they do work. Okay, so I've tested these skill sets in my own personal life, in the lives of those that I cover in ministry, and um, in the lives of those that I train and mentor, and it works, right? This is all biblically based. Every book that I write um, is substantiated in scripture. Okay, so you can, you can always go back in any point that I make to you, you can always go back in scripture and substantiate it. I'm not going to pull anything out of my head to try to sound deep. 
Okay, um, so we're going to talk tonight about the prophet declares war. Several points here, and I'm going to take a few moments just to go through each of them. First, I want to explain to you that warfare is a part of life. Please do not think that just because you gave your life to Christ, that all of your battles, all of your troubles are going to be over. Demons won't bother you anymore. People won't bother you. My friends, nothing can be further from the truth. And for those of you who are operating in pastoral ministry to a greater or less degree, particularly those of you who are evangelists, you need to make certain that as you are um, winning people over or evangelizing people to Christ, make sure they understand that. Because I've seen it where um, someone is being ministered and they've been witnessed to. And I've heard people say, you know, God is going to make your life so easy. God is going to do this. And that's a partial truth. Yes, the, he, the Lord said, cast your cares upon me because, my care, I, because I care for you. But you cannot... Um, uh, avoid or overlook the fact that there is warfare in this Christian journey. Number one, because you change partners, um, because you originally or uh, initially had a destination for hell. You were hell bound, like on a speeding train and God came in and he turned it right. God overturned the verdict dirty and he saved you and he delivered you. And now you're on your way to the kingdom land, right. To be with Jesus. Um, so the enemy is not going to sit by and just let you enjoy this life with Christ. He's not going to sit by and let you receive the restoration or the restitution from all the things that he has stolen from you down through the years before you were saved. Um, so there is warfare in this life. Jesus said it. He's the greatest prophet, right? He said it in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me, you might have peace. So yeah, we do want people to understand that there is peace in Christ. There is safety in Jesus, all of that, right? But don't overlook and don't abandon the point that he also said that in the world, you will have tribulation, tribulation, root word trial, right? Or tried, you will be tried. And you will be tried on every hand with everything from every side of the coin you can imagine. Like you're gonna always face opposition. You're gonna always face demons. And I, in my second point here, you're gonna face, I call it the threefold cord of enemies. Threefold cord of enemies. Number one, your flesh, you. You can be your greatest enemy. My apostle says, says it best, the inner me, right? things that you have been accustomed to. Well, this is the way I am. And this is, I've always been like that. That part of your nature will fight that God nature that's trying to be developed and um, cultivated in you. Your old ways, your old mannerisms, the way you used to talk to people, the way you used to treat people, the way you used to handle your business. That just because you get saved doesn't mean that part of you just disappears. You, are, you have been crucified with Christ. And yes, it's no longer I, but Christ inside. But there is some of you still in there, right? And so your soul is continually being saved. So salvation is not a one and done. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Uh, you have to continue that work. The Bible says work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. So every day we have to give God a fresh yes. Every day we have to acknowledge our shortcomings and things that are in us. Like Paul said, um, he said, you know, when I want to do good, evil is present. There's a, this flesh is in me, it's war. And it's, it, there's a, there's a war, internal war that goes on between your flesh and the spirit of God. So you don't just turn a switch on and you automatically become super religious and super saved and super perfect. Um, we will never, myself included, we will never be perfect until the day of Christ. We are being perfected. And that's why God has established the apostles and the prophets and the pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth, because we are here to help you in that work. We're here to help de develop you in that work and mature you in that work. But even us, even we ourselves are growing in that as well. Nobody has arrived, okay? So we're all growing. We're all coming to the fullness of Christ, um, fullness of God in Christ Jesus. So your flesh can be one of your greatest warfares. Um, if let's just say if you were an alcoholic before God saved you, guess what? That temptation will still be there. Jesus said it, when those demons are cast out, they go into dry places, they seek rest and they find none. And guess what? They come back. They come back to that former habitation looking for a room. And so it's our job, once we've been delivered from alcoholism or drug addiction or sex addiction or food addiction or whatever your addiction thing was, it's our job then 
to hold on to the things of Christ, right? Establish a good study habit system in your life so you know the word. You don't have to wait to get to church for somebody to pray for you or wait to get to a prophet for a word. You need to take that responsibility for yourself, right? You need to study the word of God for yourself. You need to grow in God for yourself. Right now, there's a thing trending in church circles where we have church leaders who are deceiving a flock, preaching a doctrine and have benefited from it. And now, you know, they had a come to Jesus moment or whatever you want to call it. And they're, and, and, and they're admitting I was an error. I made a mistake, burn the book. So you have to know the word of God for yourself because any man can steer you wrong, right? And even the Bible says when Apostle Paul, which was one of the greatest apostles of the New Testament, the Bible talks about the Bereans, B-E-R-E-A-N-S. And these folks didn't just take Paul's word for what he preached. They wrote down what he said and they said, we will study it to see if it be so. So you have to not, and, and I'm just saying this because it needs to be said, um, not become so infatuated with the speaker that you miss the message. Write your scriptural notes down. I, I know folks want to go to church and you want to run on top of the pews and you, you know you just want to have this great ecstatic experience. But then what are you left with when you get home? What do you have that's going to carry you through the week? What do you have that's going to carry you when you're having trouble at work or trouble in your home or trouble in your body or trouble, you know what I'm saying? Period, trouble. What do you have? You can't live off of a shout. You can't live off of a dance. The Bible says, um, uh, oh gosh, what did Jesus say in Matthew 4 and 4? He said, um, uh, gosh, uh, the word, the bread, I got to look that up real quick because I want you all to get that. Man should, thank you, Holy Spirit. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4 and 4. So you can't get to a point to where you just take in what people are um, feeding you, right? Um, or taking what you think is going to be necessary for your own survival. You need to feed off of that word, okay? So I'm gonna back away from that and continue in this message. So um, your, in, your own flesh can be your enemy. It can be your greatest enemy. Um, sometimes memories, the way that you were treated, we call it trauma, right? I'm tra I've been trauma trained in trauma. Yeah, I've been traumatized, but I'm a trauma-informed practitioner. And so I understand that, that a lot of times people respond based upon trauma. Um, so, and all that stuff is embedded in the root, it's rooted in your flesh, okay? Um, so you have issues with the flesh. Then you have demons, right? You've got demons, you have demonic forces, spiritual wickedness in high places, the fallen angels, the princes of this world fighting against you. These can be spirits that are fighting you from generations. Like say, for instance, you're the first person in your family line to really get to know Jesus for real, for real. I'm not talking about the first person to attend church. But I'm talking about you're that chosen one. You're that priest of your family. You're that apostle of your family or that prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. You're that set person. You're the intercessor. And so naturally, the enemy is going to fight you. Why? So that you can lay down, right? So you can bow down and give up and walk away. And um, so that you can uh, forfeit the call of God. So you're going to find those types of attacks. Um, if you're a, a leadership position, I declare to you the truth you will have enemies that will fight you. Why? Because you stand in position as an intercessor between God and man. You receive what God is saying. You're delivering to the people. You're watching what the people are doing. You're taking that to God, right? You, you're delivering words of salvation, breakthrough, deliverance, and healing, empowerment. And you think the enemy is going to sit by and just let you set God's people free? So many times you find, and that's all through the New Testament, the battles with Jesus. Well, he didn't do anything wrong, right? People watched him, people mocked him, people spied on him. They set him up, right? Same thing with Paul, Peter, all the other apostles. Anytime you have someone who is standing in that leadership position, yeah, the, the heat is going to be on because the enemy wants you, number one, he wants to take you out, period, kill you, John 10, 10, he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, um, but he doesn't want you in that position for people to hear from God or grow close to God and, and walk in uh, the things that God has for them, so, you know, depending on your vocation, um, you can expect certain types of battles, and I, I taught a school in apostolic leadership five-fold leadership years ago, and I talked about the different types of battles assigned to different ministry gifts. Um, so demons are going to fight you. Your own flesh, you will fight you. Um, some of us blame devils. Many times, it's us. It's not even an enemy. There are things that we do, self-inflicted wounds, 
things that we do to harm ourselves or to set ourselves back and we blame devils and it's not a devil it's your flesh so you got the flesh fighting you 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 have demons fighting you and thirdly threefold called of demonic attack right on warfare you can have human agents of satan and yes you can categorize them as your witches and your warlocks i'm just going to call it folks letting the devil use them okay and that's just across the board it folks listen the enemy does not discriminate he will use whoever he will use you he'll use people close to you people who don't like you he doesn't discriminate whoever will let him use him let him use them he's going to use them so at any given time when jesus talks about this in john 16 33 at any given time you're going to find yourself caught up in in in, in the cross hairs or the crossfires of these three types of warfare either with your flesh demons or humans being used by demons okay um uh, my next point is you cannot escape warfare i've known people and some of you may be listening and i love you but here goes the truth you cannot go to a cave to escape your warfare you cannot go to the beach to escape trust me <laughs> i just came from the beach you cannot escape warfare it doesn't matter there's no place on earth that you can go. Well, I'll go here. I'll go to on vacation. I'm going to take three days off. I'm going to go on a sabbatical. Listen, Jesus went into the mountains, went to the mountains, to the wilderness, and was tested. Now, Jesus, I said, 40 days. And who was there? Satan. So if the enemy followed Jesus to the wilderness, please don't be deceived and think the devil can't follow you to the beach. Okay, or to the wherever you go, mountains, whatever place you like to go to get away at Musa. Trust me, the enemy is there. Okay, so there's no place, there's no earthly place that you can escape um, warfare. It's it, it it's the it's the cosmic space that we're in. Remember, he was cast down. The Bible says to the earth, having great wrath, for his time has come. So, people, please stop acting brand new. When you go through trials and when you have tribulations, please stop acting as if this is something I don't understand it. This doesn't make sense. I didn't do anything wrong. When I hear those types of remarks and comments being made, it's proof to me that you don't know your Bible and you don't know the God of the Bible because Jesus plainly said it more times than one. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have, uh, um, you know, people are going to come against you. Wars and rumors of wars, families against families, in-laws, family. Jesus said it. So we we really have to. And as a, one of my spiritual daughters, um, Prophet LaDonna, she's been launching this series on getting back to the Bible. I think that's what it's called. And, and I'm like, praise God. There's a lot of prophetic stuff out here. And don't get me twisted. I love the prophets. I'm a prophet. My dad is a prophet. I understand the prophets. I was raised up around prophets and seers. I'm not, I, I'm, I love it. I, I, my children are prophets. I love the prophets. However, there is, you know, there's some elitist stuff that happens with the prophets. There's some, some goofy stuff that happens that provokes me. Um, you know, it, it is really provocative because there's too much flesh. And this is why we have to come and do teachings like this to sit down and make it plain. We don't have a keyboard and an organ and a choir. We're just going to have a conversation, okay? Um, because we need to come back to the word of God. So you cannot escape warfare. Jeremiah 28 verse 8 says, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war. This is the prophet Jeremiah. Y'all like to quote Jeremiah 29, 11. Well, make sure you flip back a chapter and look at Jeremiah 28, 8, because he's telling you, he said, even before my time, prophets have been declaring war. He said, even, listen, of old, prophets have been declaring war. And so this chapter is talking about how the prophet declares war. And, and I'm going to get into that in, in a few moments. want to keep laying some foundation here. Um, I gave you the opening scripture in terms, of, in terms of Psalm 144, verse 1, which is the strategy for war. And how does this work? First of all, we acknowledge God, okay? You don't get, and I'm putting my point right here, you don't get to declare your own war. And I've seen that too, and I'm like, epic failure. You do not get to declare your own war. I don't care how mad you are with somebody. I don't care how frustrated you are with somebody. I don't care how spiritual you feel. I don't care which conference you just came out of and you feel like you can tackle kingdoms <laughs> and, 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 and prince demons. If God has not declared war, right? through his prophet or any other believer, but we're talking about prophets particularly. If God has not declared war, you have not been equipped for war. 
And if you declare war without the artillery and the equipment and the support that you need, you will lose miserably, okay? You will lose miserably because we're fighting an enemy that does not play fair. And I want you to hear me when I say this. I, I gave you the point here in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? So don't think because you have a sword, which I just bought a little dagger <laughs> from my trip last week. I think I'm going to begin like accumulating like little swords and stuff. But at any rate, just because you have a dagger or you may be a marksman or you, you know, you may be skilled in, in, in weaponry or what have you. This battle on the, in the spiritual realm and spiritual warfare is something you, 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 you've never seen a battle like this before, okay? Because every, everyone's battle is unique. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Everybody's battle. My battle does not look like your battle. Your battle does not look like mine. And so what I need to carry me through my battle may not be, need, may not be what you need to carry through for your battle. You've got to hear from God. That's why he has to teach you how to do war. He has to equip you. He'll teach your hands to war and your fingers. Fingers represent the equipment, right? The way you hold, what you hold, how long you hold, how much pressure do you apply? He has to teach you how to do that so that you can sustain your win. The win is guaranteed to you. In the end, we win. The entire book of Revelation, people are afraid of Revelation, but the book of Revelation is, is, is the grand finale that lets us know we win, right? From the snake, from the serpent to the dragon, we win. We triumph over death, hell, and the grave. We triumph over the false prophet. We triumph, right, over the great dragon, the mark. We triumph. And people are afraid of revelation because they don't understand that revelation guarantees us our win. But you don't get a guaranteed win if you go to battle without the chief strategist, the chief military uh, uh, lieutenant, whatever you want to call it, right? If he has not issued you the orders, what happens if anybody you if any of you have ever served in the armed forces or you have loved ones who serve in the armed forces? What happens if you go anywhere without your commander's uh, um, uh, uh, permission? A wall, right? Absent without leave. Even if you declare war and you take off, absent without leave. In other words, you vacated the space that you were uh, responsible to attend to that you're supposed to be in and you've taken off without your lieutenants, without your um, supervisor's permission. And when you're out there, nobody knows where you are. Nobody knows what you're doing. And you're going to find yourself in hostile territory, enemy territory, and praise God. May the Lord be with you. Okay. So I want to summarize these points again before we move forward. Warfare is a part of life, friends. doesn't matter how much of a prayer warrior you are, how um, faithful you are attending church, how faithful you are as a giver or a tither. Um, you, it, it's, it's inevitable. Jesus said it. Okay. Um, you, you will always at any given time have three enemies. You are the first enemy, your flesh. Okay. Demons, devils, uh, and people right? Folk, church folk, job folk, family folk, just folk, people who have not subscribed to the things of the Lord, people who are disobedient to the word of God will always bring you great trouble, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, you cannot escape warfare. It's everywhere. There's nowhere you can go. It's everywhere. It's been prophesied before. It's still being prophesied. There shall be, Jesus said, and I think in Matthew 24, 24 and 24, there shall be rumors of, um, there should be wars and rumors of wars. And many times we're looking at what's happening in the Ukraine on Russia. And I'm talking about what's happening within you, the war between your two ears um, or the war in your heart. Strategy for war is found in Psalm 144, verse one. God will teach your hands to war and um, your fingers to fight. In other words, if he's declaring you for war, he's going to equip you and he's going to teach you and he's going to make sure you have everything you need to sustain your win. Warfare is not carnal. Cursing somebody out is not warfare. Uh, using uh, carnal weapons, physical weapons is not warfare, okay? This battle is a, is a cosmic battle. You're battling things in the second heavens. If you battle against demons, even sometimes demons using people, you're still battling against those demons that are influencing those people. And so the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty, what? Through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing into captivity every thought to the what obedience of christ okay and that i gave you um second Corinthians 10 4 but i also quoted 
um, uh, 10 5 as well. And you don't get to declare your own war. You have to wait. Some things you have to go through it patiently. Some things you just have to trust God. Some things you just have to wait on the Lord and be of good courage and let him strengthen your heart. You don't, for every battle you go through, remember he told, um, oh Lord, what was the man's name? The prophet. He said, you don't need to fight in this battle, right? Send the worship, send the praise. So again, every battle looks different. Okay. So I open up in chapter one and chapter two, for the most part, I kind of talked about it in both chapters. I talked about Deborah and Barak. Um, and I'm only going to just pull out a verse of that. I encourage you to go back and read Judges 4 and 5. I believe it's covered in Judges chapter 4 and 5. I know it's in Judges 4, but I encourage you to, to read it so you can get some foundation and so that the Holy Spirit can speak to you um, personally about what's taking place. So in Judges 4 verses 6 through 7, then she sent, she, meaning Deborah, uh, called for Barak, the son of Abinoam from from all of that, right? And said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded? So here you have the prophetess Deborah, right? She was a female prophet. There are a lot of folks said, well, the woman can't preach. I don't know how you can preach and not prophesy. I mean, I don't know how you can prophesy and not preach. Like, I don't understand that. And again, we, we've got to get back to the God of the Bible and, and get back to what God is saying, right? When Paul said that, when he said, I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over man, it is because the, the Corinthian women were very worldly women, very sensual women, and they were unlearned. In their culture, the Corinthian men were the more um, business savvy. They were the more educated ones. The women were not allowed, just like back in, in as African-American back in my culture, African-Americans were not allowed to read and study and receive schooling and so forth. And so with the Corinthian women, their jobs, their roles were more domesticated. And so when Apostle Paul came in and he's teaching them the things about Christ and they have spiritual gifts that have been activated and, and stirred up in, within them, they didn't know how to govern themselves. They had never been trained. They had never been taught, never had that opportunity. And so many times in the, in the gatherings, they would be loud. They would be, um, you know, disruptive. And so for that reason, Paul said, don't let them speak. And it wasn't, he didn't muzzle them, you know, indefinitely. There was some more teachings that needed, that they needed to receive. And, and, and so that was the reason for that. But we have some that have taken that and made a whole doctrine out of it and have tried to shut down the voice um, of God's daughters, but the devil is a liar. So we find this in the Old Testament because folks are struggling with the Old Testament right now for some reason. Um, but in the Old Testament, Deborah was not just a prophet. She was the judge. So again, why would God doesn't contradict himself, right? And I'm, I know I'm, I'm hitting two points here, but one stone, but God does not contradict himself. Why would he, in the New Testament, when Jesus said, the, he gave everybody the Holy Ghost, right? And, and he said, here, receive the comforter. And Joel said, you know, um, your sons and daughters to prophesy. How, how does that, how do you get to prophesy and you don't get to speak in church? Like, I don't understand what, that, so that doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make common sense. That certainly doesn't make biblical sense. So we've got to, again, remember I talked about that flesh, some of the things, the battles we battle with are some of the, the um, uh, traditions, religious traditions people battle with, some of the ways you were raised, praise God. And I won't go any deeper into that, but if the spirit of God is speaking to you, tell the Lord, thank you. So this woman had a leadership position in Israel. She was the mother to Israel. She was the judge to Israel. And she was the prophet to Israel. And so here she approaches um, Barak and she tells him, has not the Lord God of Israel? She's speaking on behalf of the Lord. Okay. She's clearly authorized to do so. Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun and against you I, uh, and against you, I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. So this was, uh, uh, Deborah was reminding Barak of a word God had already given him. She said, Have, didn't the Lord tell you this? And so here now the prophet has to come in and again, represent God to this man. Now, I want you to pay attention to how detailed, because we're still talking about the six obligations of the prophet in spiritual warfare. And for this particular um, 
series, we're talking about the prophet declares war. Barak would not do it. God wanted it done. He told the prophet, go and make sure that it gets done. That's why for a prophet, a life of strict obedience is required. And I need to say that again, for a prophet, a lifestyle of strict obedience. You don't get to do what you want to do, how you want to do it, when you get ready to do it, and call yourself a prophet. It doesn't work like that. Ask Jonah. He preached and prophesied one time, and God fired him, and he let him keep the title, and he even put him in the Bible, but God never used him because his disobedience disqualified him. Um, she says to him, and I want to bring these points out to you. She says, first of all, didn't God already tell you? So that prophet is going to remind you of what God had already told you. This is not going to be something brand new, like, wow, I didn't know. No, you knew, right? You knew this is what God wanted you to do for whatever reason you didn't do it. And so that prophet is going to come to you and reinforce what God has already said. And then she says, go. And she tells him exactly what the Lord said. Didn't God tell you to do this? Didn't God tell you to deploy troops? Didn't, and this, she tells him exactly how many men he said, take 10,000 men. Remember, I said in Psalm 144, verse 1, God will teach your hands to war, fingers to fight. Remember, I told you that whenever God is going to declare war, he's going to make sure you have everything you need. God knew that Barak would need 10,000 men, not 9,999, not 10,001. He knew exactly how many men he would need. Then he says, I want them from the troops of Naphtali and Zebulun. He didn't want them from the troop of Dan. He didn't want them from the troop of Judah. He didn't want them from the troop of Issachar. He only wanted men, 10,000 men from Naphtali's tribe and Zebulun's tribe. Again, look at how specific this is, okay? And then here's the clincher. She says, and against you, I will deploy Sisera. So now God is telling you, I'm gonna draw this enemy out against you. Now, somebody's like, wait a minute, hold on. I was, I was with you, Apostle, when you said I'm going to have 10,000 men with me in battle. I heard you when you said take the folks from Zebulun and, and Naphtali, but now, wait a minute, you mean to tell me God's going to draw an enemy? Like, you, he's going to draw him to me, like, to confront me? Like, God doesn't do that. Yes, he does. Yes, he got, does. God will draw enemies out. God will allow people to pick on you, to talk about you, to betray you, mishandle you, just so that he can show forth his glory in your life. And you need to understand that. That's why you have to quit acting brand new when certain things happen. I had to learn that this year. I had some situations happening and I had to go to God. I'm like, God, I have never seen nothing like this before. And I mean, enemies were being drawn out after me one by one. And the Lord, I kept going to God. I said, God, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Lord, help me because I don't want to get out of character. Again, I don't want my flesh to be a part of my warfare, right? And the Lord ultimately showed me what he was doing and he has done it and he's still doing it, okay? But he will be very specific and he will let you know, I'm going to draw this enemy out after you. I'm going to have them come for you, right? That's a part of that God thing folks don't understand. Well, the Lord said he's going to fight my battles. He also will draw you into a battle. <laughs> he'll draw you into a battle. My God. So he said, I'm going to draw Sisera out against you. Listen, and he tells them who Sisera is. So it's not like you don't know who your enemy is. He says, Sisera, he is the commander of Jabin's army. So not only is this just Sisera coming against you, but this is a commander, like a high ranking military official God is going to bring against Barack. No wonder Barack was like, no, nah, I, I, I didn't even hear God. That was a bad dream. I'm not even going to do that. And God was like, no, you're going to do it. <laughs> you're going to do it, right? So I would deploy Sisera and the commander of Jabez's army, listen, with his chariots and his multitude. Are you hearing God? Here's what the Lord is saying. This is why you got to hold on to Psalm 144, 144 verse 1. God will teach your hands to war and your fingers to fight because some of the battles that you'll find yourself facing, your enemies can be more, well, they can look like they're more against you than for you, right? Remember, um, Elisha prayed that prayer when Gehazi was having a fit because uh, the folks was coming against Elisha and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Gehazi was having a fit. And he was like, they have more for us than, than there's more against us than with us. And Elisha prayed, he said, Lord, open my servant's eyes that he can see that there are more for us than against us. And what did God do? God opened up Eli um, Gehazi's eyes and he began to, he was, he received an immediate activation in the sea realm and he saw chariots, horses of fire, glory, glorious horses lying on top of every mountain. 
but he can only see that through the realm of the spirit. Elisha knew that. And so you have to know that too. It doesn't matter how strong your enemies are, how numerous your enemies are. If God, the Bible says, listen, if God before me, he's more than a world against me. You have to know that word to be true. And so, but God is telling Barak, I'm going to bring the captain of the army against you. He's going to have his chariots and his multitude. And this is where they're going to meet you. So the Lord didn't leave any details out at all. And then he says, I will deliver him into your hand. Again, your victory is, is established. If you do what you're supposed to do, if you follow what God is telling you to do, you will surely win. So Deborah is very clearly articulating to Barack, this is what the battle, here is where the battle lines are drawn, okay? Um, the Lord told you to do that. You wouldn't do it, but you're going to do it, okay? And then later on, you'll find that he tells her, I will not go except you go with me. And there are some people like that. And I, I cover that later on in, um, in the book that there will be times that God will use you to... Um, you know, to declare war and say, hey, this is what's happening. You need to get ready. You need to mount up. You need to gird up your loins. You need to get ready for battle. And they may say to you, woman of God, man of God, I'm afraid. Can you pray with me? Can you stand with me? And guess what? You are required to do that. If God sent you to declare that war, and if that person feels inadequate or, you know, unsure, and that's a battle that God once fought, you will have to stand with that person. And that's why that book is called The Obligations, because to be a prophet is more than thus said, the Lord say, get ready three days, stand up, you're going to be rich in new car. No, there's so much, there's deeper levels of prophetic ministry that goes beyond giving people gifts. <laughs> you got, that's the very bare level. That's like, that's like entry level prophetic ministry. Oh, the Lord says a new car. Well, duh, you know, word of God says, if you seek the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added. So, you know, do I really need a word for that? But I mean, if that's where you are, work with what you got. But just know, like I mentioned last week, there are evolutions of prophetic ministry, right? And there are progressions of prophetic ministry where you go deeper and you can, and if you can go deeper, you can take the people of God with you there as well. So she tells um, Barack, this is what God has commanded you to do. Go and deploy, get ready for battle. Well, you know, when I get saved, the Lord's going to fight all my battles and I'm going to sit here and just praise Jesus till I die. That's not scripture. And you will live a very, you will live a, live, live a very defeated life. You will still die and go to heaven though. But you won't have no works. You won't have no crowns because you haven't fought no, no battles, right? You just love Jesus. Well, you know, I'm just going to pray about it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit here and let the Lord fight my battles. And you, you have yet to tap into that, that soldier realm where you're fighting the fight, the battles of the Lord. When, and, and later on, I'll talk about, matter of fact, I think I mentioned it here in some of my notes. I talk about different one, different prophets that God used to do battles. We'll talk about that in a minute. So she deploys, um, reminds Barak that God told him to deploy, get ready for battle. All right. She gives him the strategy. What does that strategy look like? This is how many people you need. This is where you need to get them from. This is your enemy. This is where he's from. And this is what's coming. This is where you need to meet. Like, I don't know what more he can give you. And then he tells you, you're going to win. All you have to do is be obedient and show up. All right. She, she um, gives him the numbers of men to take in the battle, tells him which men to take the battle, tells him precisely where the battle is located, tells him where the battle is to occur and the expected end. She does all of that. Awesome, powerful woman of God. Every battle is unique. Now that was um, Barack's battle. And later on, you'll find out, I'll just give you a spoiler alert. Um, he does tell Deborah, you know, I'm not going unless you go with me. She said, fine, I'll go. But this battle will be won in the, in, the, in the name of a woman, essentially. And that's exactly what happened. She went to war with him, right? And then guess what? Sisera went um, looking for somebody and ended up in this woman's house, well, in this man's house. The man, her husband, was out to battle. And the woman was at home, just again, domesticated, right? And that's where, you know how the Bible says in Deuteronomy, I think it's 22, 5, 7, I think, where the Bible says, um, a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. And again, people have taken up that. Well, a woman not supposed to wear pants. And a woman not supposed to, and, and again, remember I talked about the flesh stuff that you've been brought up in that can be an enemy to you, enemy to your growth, enemy to your maturity in the things of God. First of all, Everybody wore gowns and robes back in those days. 
the linen breeches were for the priests. They wore those when they went into the te um, temple to do service, right? And it was a special blend because God didn't want, it couldn't have any wool because God didn't want them to sweat. That's a whole nother message. But everybody wore robes back in those days. Nobody wore pants. So for God to say, I don't want a woman to wear pants, it would be irrelevant because women didn't wear pants. So when you find it in Deuteronomy 22, I think it's 22 and five, he was not referring to a woman wearing pants, okay? He was referring to a woman not going into battle. He didn't want a woman putting, putting on a uh, warfare um, battle, battle clothes. If I guess there's another word I'm trying to use. He didn't want a woman going into battle. He wanted the men to fight for battle. So that's a woman should not wear that which pertain to a man. He did not want women going into battle. He reserved the battles for the men. So case in point, when Sisera enters into, um, I think the man's name was Heber, the Kenite, um, he went into his house. He was, it, again, he's at war, right? And Barak and the army and everybody's looking for him. This man is tired. He's worn out. He ends up going into Heber, the Kenite's house. Well, Jael, which is pronounced Yael, um, is home, right? Just being home, doing what she does at home. And listen, Remember, Deborah prophesied and said, Barak, because you wouldn't go, the battle will be won in the name of a woman. Well, guess what? Sisera, because Barak was supposed to take Sisera, Sisera ends up in this woman's house. Her husband is out the battle, out the war. He ends up at her house asking for something to drink, right? She gives him some milk, some warm, I think it was goat milk. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. And he falls asleep on her lap. There wasn't nothing sexual, sensual, and none of that stuff. I don't know what girlfriend put in that milk. She put the brother out. He went, fell asleep, probably was tired or whatever. And she took a tent peg, which is like about maybe this. Y'all can see that. A tent peg, not a nail, a tent peg and drove it through his skull. That's in your Bible, okay? She impaled him. She killed him. Now, she, and she didn't have to violate the word of God. She didn't have to put on all of this army stuff. He came in her house and she used a household item to take the brother out. And so when Deborah prophesied and said a battle will be won in the name of a woman, it was Yael, Heber's wife, that killed Sisera, that Barak was supposed to kill her. So anyway, you got to go back and read all of that. So I, I just kind of want to close that part of the chapter for you. So every battle is unique, right? Um, you have natural disasters. And I just gave you some examples. You guys can come up with your own. Natural disasters, think about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Who was the prophet that interceded or that had a hand in that? It was Abraham. No, Abraham didn't cause it, but Abraham was involved to a greater or less degree. Think about tribal extinction. Think about um, with that, my example is Israel and the Amalekites. God wanted to destroy the Amalekites from the times when Israel was in the wilderness, right? And, um, and, and so God had this vendetta against the Amalekites, and he tells Samuel to tell Saul to go and kill these folks. Saul wouldn't do it. Who had to do the work? Samuel. Uh, property loss. Another example, Israel and the Moabites. This was during a time of Gideon, uh, when they were so afraid of, uh, remember the Moabites were taking like all of Israel's um, farming stuff. Gideon was afraid and, um, you know, the Moabites were a great enemy. And what happened? God overthrew that using the prophet Gideon. Removal of office. This happened between David and Saul, David being another prophet. Saul had um, violated his prophet, his king's office. And David went into intercession, obedience, listening to Samuel and Nathan. And guess what? Saul was dethroned, removed from office, and David took the throne. Another example, again, these are all different types of battles and warfares where prophets were involved and they had to follow very strategic instructions uh, for them to, uh, for the win, to get to the win. Loss of status, Cain and Abel. Well, Abel was a prophet because he knew instinctively the type of worship God wanted. Abel knew that God wanted worship that had blood on it. He wanted offerings that had blood on it. I wish people would get that today, they, but that's another... I, that's another message. Uh, Cain, what did Cain do? Just flesh, right? And so the battle was, was Abel's blood that cried out from the ground. And as a result, Cain lost his status. He was remanded to uh, become a wanderer, um, pretty much a homeless man for the rest of vagabond for the rest of his life. So he lost his status. That was another form of warfare. And then the, another form of warfare here is loss of life. And here is the battle between Israel, right? The children of Israel 
and the house of Eli. What was happening with Eli? Eli uh, was not a true priest to the people and his sons were sleeping with the women who would bring offerings to the temple. And so who did God use to, inter to, to introduce that type of warfare? Samuel, the prophet. So again, every battle is unique. And I've given you some examples here. There are many, many, many more. Um, but these are some of the most, I guess, popular examples that you can probably relate to. So I mentioned to you earlier, I told you about Psalm 144, verse 1, and how the Lord will teach our hands to war, our fingers to fight. Jesus is the chief military strategist. If he doesn't tell you to go to war or what to use in the war, or who to take with you to war, don't go to war. <laughs> I don't know how plainer to make that. You should never attempt to declare war against certain spiritual enemies without receiving clearance from the chief of the army of hosts. And that's a quote I've taken directly out of my book. Never declare a war against the enemy unless God has given you clearance. And again, I, I, I refer you back to all of those battles that I showed you, Eli, um, Saul, Sodom and Gomorrah, Cain, um, you know, all of these examples, the Moabites, the um, uh, Amalekites, the word of the Lord came, God said, and then you find the expected end. So you never go to war. You may say, I'm sick and tired of dealing with this. I'm, I've been going through this. My children have been going through this. My mama, you need to make sure that you are hearing from God. Scripture says in Psalm 37, 23 through 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Let God order your steps. Let God declare your war for you. And the person I couldn't remember, it was Jehoshaphat, okay? Um, he told Jehoshaphat, you don't have to fight, right? The, send Judah, let the praise, let the worshipers go forth and I'll do battle for you. Um, so the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. When God delights in your way, the Bible says, he will make even your enemies to be at peace or he will make your enemies your footstool. So think about that. When God is pleased with you, God will, listen, the, the fruit of God being pleased with you is him dealing with your enemies. This is why he told you, Jehovah's Spirit, you don't have to fight. There are certain battles you don't have to fight. Your obedience, your status with the Lord himself will do the battle for you, okay? I want you to understand that because you're ready to fight. I'm about to pray. I'm going on a three-day fast. I'm, and and, and that's wonderful. There's nothing against fasting, but is this the fast? Is this the Lord's fast? Did God ordain that? Some people, and again, nothing against fasting. Fasting is wonderful. But sometimes people fast because they feel like they're trying to move God's hand. Well, I'm going to fast so God can move. That's not the way fasting works. Is this not the fast that I have commanded to break the yokes, to relieve the fatherless, right? They're, the fast that God has chosen is a fast to draw you away from your enterprise. It draws you away from all of your stuff, your busyness, your being preoccupied, where God pulls you into himself and says, sit down and be quiet. And either let me talk to you or let me talk to you. It's not something you do. It's a time to be quiet. Sackcloth and ashes in, 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 in Israel was a time of mourning. It was a time when Israel said, I've sinned, we've sinned, God, we don't hear you. We don't know where you are. We might as well just die. And you die to yourself so that God, your, your flesh dies so your spirit can come alive. And so again, I think many people get it twisted with I'm going on a fast. I'm, you go on a fast because you're sick and tired of something. That's not, that's not the solution to a problem is going on a fast so God can fix it. You don't, a fast does not force God's hand. God has to call a fast. God has to call a fast. And praise God, I'm not going to go deeper into that, but we, we've abandoned that. And, and not only have we abandoned it, but I think many of us, we don't understand how that works. Okay. You don't understand. Um, when the, the Lord, there was a question and the Lord said, you don't fast when the bridegroom is there with you, right? And so one of the, the reasons for a fast is when the bridegroom is not with you, right? And again, you die to yourself. You crucify your flesh so that Christ can arise, that God nature and you can arise. So I, I pray that you all understand it. Again, I'm not knocking you fast. Some people fast every Wednesday. So that's wonderful. If God ordained it, wonderful. And if you're doing it the way, the biblical prescribed way, wonderful. But if you're fasting just because you're fed up with something or you're mad or you, it's been a long time since you fasted, it's a religious fast and it's not the fast that God has chosen. Okay. 
Um, so the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. When God delights in, in your way, there are things you don't have to ask God for. He will do them as a result of him taking pleasure in you. When Mary found favor with God, she was not in her room praying, oh, Lord, please make me the mother of Jesus. Oh, please let Joseph. You don't have to do that, people of God. Your lifestyle will attract the presence of God. And God is the gift giver. When he comes, he brings gift. Jesus departed and he left gifts to men. That's the way it works. Praise God. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord will do what? Uphold him with his hand. Even if you stumble, because being walking upright before the Lord doesn't mean you're perfect. You're going to make mistakes because you live in a human body. You live in the flesh and you will make mistakes. But if you acknowledge that and you understand that, Lord, I've I, I fallen short. The same thing happened with David. I fell short of your glory, Lord God. Please, Lord God, redeem me, help me, strengthen me then, you know, God will, he will uphold you with his hand, okay? So what happened, and I'm coming to a close. What happens when you declare your own war? And this is the word of God coming out of Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. Then some Jews who went around trying to drive out demons attempted to use the name of the Lord Jesus on those who had evil spirits saying, this is what they said. I command you by that Jesus whom Paul preaches seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit told them, Jesus, I know, and I'm Paul, I know, the King James says, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Then that man with the evil spirit jumped on them and assaulted them. King James Version said it ripped the clothes off of them, right? On one version, ripped the clothes off of them, got the better of them, and violently overpowered all of them that they fled out of that house naked and bruised. This is what happens when people undertake their own war. You declare your own war. God has not told you to go. He has not even looked in your, your uh, direction to go. But yet, I'm going to do it. I'm going to war. I'm going to battle. And you've done it without Psalms 144, verse 1. Your fingers hadn't been taught. Your hands hadn't been taught. you just out there. Guess what? You have no covering. There's no protection. There's no grace. And you can be overpowered. All right. And listen, they said uh, not just Skiva, the seven, the, his family was affected. So be very careful. Not just you, just because I'm doing battle, I'm coming against a Leviathan, I'm coming against the Prince of Persia. You better be careful because these spirits, I told you, they don't fight fear and they will come and they will attack your household. And some of you, I, I can feel you in the realm of the spirit. Some of you have tapped into some stuff, trying to be deep and spiritual, right? trying to impress somebody with your wonderful prayer vocabulary and you entered into realms that you were not authorized to do so. And for some of that, you, some of the backlash is because you went unauthorized areas. What happens if you're in an unauthorized area? Uh, you deal with the, the consequences. Okay. So you want to be mindful, make sure that the Lord is declaring your war. You don't get to declare your war. You wait and you let God say, okay, daughter, son, or whatever or when the prophet, a real prophet, praise God, comes and give you some instructions about how that war is gonna be won, what you need to, to fight the war and what the end of that war is gonna look like. A real prophet will tell you that, okay? So I'm coming to a close. This has been our first um, week of study and the six obligations of the prophet in spiritual warfare. I certainly pray that it has been a blessing to you. And this is a phenomenal time to give. Again, that's a scary word to a lot of people. Um, but praise God, I want you all to um, jot this down, screenshot it or what have you. Many of you already have it. And I want you to be a blessing to the ministry. Amen. And, um, and I want you to get ready to come back next Wednesday, same time, same place, so that we can continue on. If you have the book, read ahead, because if you notice, if you have the book, I didn't even cover a whole lot, because, well, first of all, I wrote the book, um, and I, I remember being in school when I was in, um, I was in college, and I had a psychology professor, and we had to buy this book. This book was like 70-something dollars, right? And he said, well, I wrote, the, he, well, he was a, like a co-author or what have you. And, you know, you got to make sure, you know, the book was part of that required reading this joke, but it didn't even, <laughs> we, I mean, he may have read a few passages out of this big, thick book, but for the most part, because he wrote it, he just talked. 
And it was good stuff, but I'm just saying, you know, don't think I'm just going to sit here and read this book verbatim to you because you don't need anybody to read the book to you, but I'm going to, along with the book, just kind of give you some additional insights of things that will be helpful to you as you move forward in your prophethood, prophetic journey, and prophetic life as a believer. All right. So we bless God for you. We um, truly love teaching and ministering the word of God. We're in the six obligations of the prophet and spiritual warfare in August, the burden of prophetic ministry. I am still working on some chapters. So some of you have already reached out looking for that book. It is not available right now. Um, when it does become available, I will let you all know on our um, Facebook page. Um, or if you're in the ministry, I'll let you know. But that it's going to take about another week or so. But it'll definitely be done by August. And, and so you'll be able to have a copy of it. I'm Hopefully within the next week, I'll have that finished. So you can have it and kind of start going through it or what have you. Uh, but at any rate, we bless God for you. And um, we look forward to coming back to you um, Sunday at uh, 12, 1 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And um, until then, you guys be blessed, be safe, and continue to... Um, seek God for the prophetic, beautiful gift to bless God's people. Just do it right. Amen. So you can find yourself on the right side of God. All right. Grace and peace. God bless you.